All right, Mark's going to share with us this morning, but I just want to, I'm always gone when Mark speaks, and I just want to just mock him now for a couple minutes. No. No, I just want to know that, I just want everyone to know how much I value Mark as a brother and friend, and, uh, and I really trust him so much when he speaks, and he really has our heart, and so I asked Mark to share us this Sunday because uh, he has such good words for our congregation, and so can we give him a round of applause? He's so great, and then I can pray that he'll be. Well, hello. <clears throat> Ooh. Choked up there. <clears throat> it was a communion. Um, hey, so my name is Mark Steiger. I'm glad I'm here today with you guys. Um, I did get the defective <laughs> palm branch. Um, you know, so <clears throat> today is Palm Sunday. So when I was a kid, um, I always thought Palm Sunday was like the palm of your hand. And I thought that was the day that like the church invented to raise your hands during church, but you were only supposed to do it on that day. You know, so it was always kind of weird when we handed out palm branches because I was like, why are we handing these out? Um, so this is Holy Week. I love this week. This is an exciting week. Um, we have Easter coming up on next Sunday, right? Friday is Good Friday. And it's one of those things where I think so many times <clears throat> this time, especially if, if you're like me who's grown up in the church, Easter has kind of been this weird thing, right, where we celebrate eggs and Easter chipmunks and things like that because my mom would always bite the ears off the Easter bunnies and then give it to us. Or actually one year my mom gave us an Easter basket and we just had like the horrible candy left and wrappers. Mom, if you're watching this, you owe me chocolate. She would get up in the middle of the night and eat all the chocolate and then we were left with the le- left leftovers, and it was horrible. Um, so we are actually going to be talking about Jesus today, one of my favorite subjects. Um, let's pray before we start. So Jesus, we love you. Um, and as, as, uh, as we worship you this morning, God, um, God, I just pray that your presence be here today. And God, um, uh, as, as we, we remember you even this week, I think the most powerful week as followers of Jesus, God, that you instill in our heart of who you are. God, I pray for, for encounters with you, um, for, for times of, of true abandonment in our worship. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, <clears throat> We are looking at Palm Sunday. So if you have a Bible or a phone or any electronic device or on the screen, um, we're going to actually read what happened on Palm Sunday. So up to this point, Jesus has been doing massive, amazing miracles, right? Um, He's been feeding thousands. He was, you know, walking on water. He healed people right and left. He raised people from the dead. It was amazing. And so all of a sudden at this point, he starts to, he knew that this was going to happen. He knew the plan that was, was created for him. And so he, he gets things ready for that. And so actually this is the time of, of kind of the Passover. And that's why we, we celebrate even with communion of that true symbol of what Jesus did. So this is in Matthew 21, verse 1 through 11. This is, as they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethage. I think that's how you pronounce it. Do you actually know the name? That name actually means the house of the unripe fig. <laughs> Why would you name your house that? Um, it, it, but it was on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them. And he will send them right away. He, this took place to fulfill the prophecy. Say to your daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of him, and those followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd responded, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. And that's amazing to me, because at this point, we see... 
there's this excitement. Actually, a few verses later, we read that <laughs> Jesus goes back into the temple and he reclaims the temple. He, he takes it away from just being a prophet thing, right? He, he overturns tables and he calls it back to God. And then even a few verses after that, we see Jesus, the lame and the blind were coming and he was just healing them right and left. It was this amazing time. I mean, I couldn't even imagine to, to be a part of this, right? Watching Jesus come in, the crowd stirring up, and everything like that. And this is where it always got me. I, growing up in the church, it always, I always struggled with this. You know, Jesus' triumphant entry. Why, why did it go from people praising Jesus, and then less than a week, people screaming, crucify him? And this is one of those things I think— I struggle with, even with the disciples, right? We see the disciples. You know, the disciples, especially the 12, Jesus prepped them on what was going to happen, right? He, he gave them a play-by-play. -play. Actually, in the book of Matthew, there's actually three accounts, but there are actually more accounts than that that Jesus would tell his disciples, hey, this is what's going to happen. In fact, like, the his second time, they're, they're starting to go down to, to Jerusalem, but it, it's in Matthew 17. He says this. He says, when... When they came together in Galilee, it was in Matthew 17, 23 through 20, or 22 through 20, 20, 20, 20 twee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a two, two and a twee. Uh, that's embarrassing. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, so he says, when they come together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he, he will be ra raised to life. And then there's this weird verse in there, like a little part of it says, and then the disciples were filled with grief. You know, I always thought, like, well, he's telling them, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is actually what's going to happen. And they kind of didn't want to believe it. Because up to this point, Jesus was doing amazing things for, for thousands of people. And they're like, uh, you don't, they're like, no, I'm not, no, no, Gio, you're joking, Jesus. You're kind of funny. And then, actually, on the way to the beginning of this Holy Week, Jesus stops with his disciples, and he tells them again. And this is um, in Matthew 20, um, 17 through 19. There's no twos in there. Um, <clears throat> he says this. Now, Jesus was going to Jerusalem, so he's on his way. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests. And the teachers of the law, they will be condemned to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he'll be raised to life. I mean, that is to the point. Have you ever been in a situation where, you, where you're given all the information beforehand? What's going to happen? And you don't pay attention, right? So <clears throat> out of my humbleness, I'm going to tell this story. My wife was pregnant with our first beautiful child, Tessa. Never had a baby before. So what do we do? We go to those birthing classes, right? It was like an eight-week birthing class. And, you know, once a week we'd go there and we'd do, like, all the weird stuff, right? Watch these weird videos. I'm like, oh, gosh. And I loved it. It was awesome. It was like stand-up comedy for me. I was hamming it up and making friends, all this stuff. And it was like awesome. And like videos would play. I'm like, oh, I make jokes. And it was, it was the greatest time of my life. Like people loved me and like said, oh, Mark, you're a mate. Well, that was in my head. But I remember it was awesome, right? And then I remember this one day I'm sleeping in bed. Christy gets up. Well, she got up all the time. Like if you've been around a pregnant woman, they urinate all the time. It's crazy. And so she gets up in the middle of the night, and then she wakes me up, and she says, Mark, my water broke. And you know what I did? I panicked. I freaked out. I'm like, oh, my gosh, get in the car. Get. And she's like calm and collected, like, Mark, I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to eat some food. I'm like, and I'm screaming, no, no, I've watched this on TV. Your water breaks? We got, like, minutes. You know, and she's like, no, it's, it's, did you pay attention to anything in class? And the first words that came in my mouth then is, I said, I should have paid attention. <laughs> right? And so then we went to the hospital, and it was, like, 33 hours later, she had her baby. And I remember those moments where she looked at me and said, I hate you. <laughs> you should have paid attention. And it was, it was hard, right? Because I had given all this information beforehand. I knew what was supposed to happen. I should have paid attention. 
And then I didn't. I didn't expect my emotion and my reality to hit like that, right? All I've ever really seen of babies was on rom-coms, right? Where baby comes out and it's like, oh, everybody freaks out and they have to run to the hospital, right? And so that was what I kind of knew and that's what I pictured, even though I was given all this information on what to actually do. And I think sometimes we, we, when, when we look at this, even this, this week, we look at that where the disciples, they knew, they were given this information on what was truly going to happen. The people who are following Jesus. In fact, if we read through that, the scripture, there, we had multiple of people following Jesus, right? He fed 5,000 people in, on multiple times. And people were following him. And those are the ones who were, who were singing Hosanna. And they were doing all this amazing stuff. And, and they knew through who Jesus was on all that, that he was going to provide. And, you know, even, even when he got to Jerusalem, you know, the He's, he's still, he presented of who he was as God. He, he cleared out his father's house. He healed people. He taught to the Pharisees. He, he gave so many parables from basically, it's, it's Matthew 21 up to the, the crucifixion. You can read it. There's so many fascinating stories and parables that Jesus is teaching who he is and what he came to do. But so many times, I don't pay attention. And I always, always struggle with this, right? So why, why don't we pay attention? Why don't we understand what's going on? Why do we go from praising Jesus with a full palm branch to ignoring him, abandoning him? That was always a struggle with me, right? Because I, I read through Scripture and we, you know, we see the story of Peter especially, right? Where he, he, he's like the guy, like, nope, nope. Jesus, no, nope, not going to happen. You know, you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. We're going out in a ball of flames. And what does he do? He books. And Jesus is like, oh, before this is going to happen, I'm going to just tell you, this is what's really going to happen. You're not going to just deny me once, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, no. And what does he do? He denies him three times. Jesus knew. And so I always struggle with this, because how do we go from this? And, and, and I think really when it comes down to it, as we kind of saw in that video, it was awesome. There was a dis- disillusionment. A disillusionment on what the followers of Jesus thought that Jesus could do for them. You know, up to this point, um, I always thought when growing up, it was like everybody abandoned him and left him. And, and that's not true. Like, there was actually disciples stayed around, and, and, but they were always in the back, Right? We, we see that Joseph and, and John and, and Mary and, and, and uh, the mother of Jesus were actually at the foot of the cross. Uh, we see that uh, it was Joseph of Arimathea. He was the one who asked um, Pilate to bring the body of Jesus down and give him a tomb. There's people who still were there, and I think they were expecting something, but when it actually happened, it wasn't what they expected to truly happen even though Jesus had, had told him. See, I think in this point where, where Jesus rides in triumphantly, people were saying, Jesus is here. He is our Savior. He's going to fix our problems. Right? At the time, you know, Israel was controlled by, by the Romans. I mean, we know that. And all of a sudden, the, the, part of it was they're seeing this, this man feeding thousands, raising people from the dead, and they're like, oh, Rome's going to get it. Yeah. Jesus, come on in Jerusalem. We're going to get those Romans. ooh wow. Right? And all of a sudden, the, Jesus comes in. They triumphantly praise him because, like, you're going to fix our problems. And it doesn't happen like that. In fact, before Jesus goes in to Jerusalem, he weeps over Jerusalem. And let me find that verse. I'm a little off. Basically, where's that verse? Basically, what happens is, I can't remember the verse, but it, it's, uh, it's it found in Luke, and I think it's like Luke 17, and he says, you know, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He says, if only you knew you would have peace that has been hidden from you. I think so many times in my life, I want peace. I, I want peace. I want Jesus there. But really, when I, when I pull back, to be honest, I want Jesus to fix my problems. I want Jesus to 
to fix those things. I want to hold on to those things. And instead of truly saying, okay, Jesus, I want to see who you really are, I look at Jesus as this guy who's going to fix those things. I've been reading this book. Um, it's really, really been messing with me. Um, it's the Bible. Um, actually, that should be messing with me. No, it's actually this other book. Uh, it's called Shattered Dreams. Um, let's see what. The, Shattered Dreams, God's Unexpected Path to Joy. It's by this um, counselor, theologian, pastor named Larry Crabb. A phenomenal guy. I actually took a, a class in my grad school from him, and it was like amazing and challenging, and I hated him, and he was awesome. It was the craziest thing, right? So he wrote this book called Shattered Dreams, and I've been reading it, um, and partly because I think so many times in my life and in our lives, we struggle with these ideas and these things happening that just feel like they cave in. And in this book, um, he really talks about what happens in our lives when our dreams and our longing of our hearts don't feel like they, they meet up. And so in this, one of his quotes, um, if I don't find it, he says this, Larry Crabb writes this, he says, basically when we, he talks about us being in tune with, with our dreams and, and in tune with who God really is, he says this, he says, but we're not self-aware. We think we're self-aware. I think I understand what God wants from me. He says, but we're not self-aware. We're out of touch with the central longing of our hearts. An encounter with him is what we want, but we don't know it. That's the second idea. Uh, he says, let me develop this further. We dream lower dreams and think there are, there are none higher. We dream of good marriages, talented kids, enough health and money to enjoy life, rewarding work, and the opportunity to make a difference in this world. All good things. Of course we want them. But we think that, there's there, that they're the best things. That's what God means when he calls us foolish. I think so many times in my life, man, I get stuck in this. I, I want God to do things for me. I think most of my prayer prayer time right now is keep me safe or keep this safe or God give me this or God allow this to happen and so much of it is I, I'm missing out on who God really wants to be in my life that encounter with God uh, Larry Crabb goes on he says this he says shatter dreams open the doors to better dreams so he talks about this where when things in life, those things that we hold on to seem like they shatter in front of us. That life moment. I lose my job. Somebody gets sick. My marriage isn't working out. All those things I'm holding on for, for those dreams all of a sudden shatter. And he says this, shattered dreams open the door for better dreams. Dreams that we do not properly value until the dreams that we improperly value are destroyed. Shattered dreams destroy false expectations, such as victorious Christians, Christian life with no real struggle or failure. They help us discover true hope. We need the help of shattered dreams to put us in touch with what we most long for, to create a felt appetite for better dreams. And living for better dreams generates a new, unfamiliar feeling that eventually recognizes joy. And this idea of shattered dream messes with me. It, it truly messes with me. Because sometimes in, in life, I think we, we it's not wrong to, to ha hold on to these things that are good. And sometimes things are going bad and we, we, we see God work. He, he shows up at the one yard line and we pray and then bam, and then Oh, it's like amazing, right? And, and sometimes we see it work and we hear those, those miracles and those testimonies of where God shows up. And then when it doesn't happen for me, all of a sudden it shatters. Everything caves in. But if I just put my trust in God for the things I get, I make a vending machine God, right? I, I put my worship as the token that goes in. 
I put, I put my, my prayer time as a time to say, okay, I'm not going to say anything bad. I'm not going to ask too much right now because I want to ask big later. I'm going to do all this stuff to get. I make this vending machine God, and then sometimes it doesn't happen, and then those dreams shatter. And, and so many times, what really happens, I want God to take away my pain, or I don't want to feel the pain that I know that's going to happen. And I think there's times in our lives where those dreams just, cave in. And like the disciples, we're lost. We're disillusioned. And it just doesn't make sense. You know, um, there was a time in my life um, years ago, I hit below rock bottom. I mean, it was bad. And I remember going through this time, I remember praying to God. I, I, I mean, I wept. I cried. I did everything that God would fix the situation. And I mean, I, I did everything. I went to pastors, I went to everything. And I remember it, it caved in. Everything just fell through. I remember thinking, God, why are you silent? Why are you not here? Why can't you fix this? I've done everything possibly right, and you let me down. Why don't you love me? And I remember this point. I just said, I, I give up. I give up on God, plain and simple. It, it destroyed my faith of what I thought faith was. It destroyed my idea of God. And it took a long time to rebuild. It was actually uh, two influential people in my life kind of stuck through me with it. One was a, he was a pastor and a cop down in Colorado Springs. Never met the dude. But a um, person in my family knew I was struggling, and they didn't, they didn't know what to do. And so they, they had a person like, hey, can you call my kid? And this guy would call me constantly. And I kept asking, man, why, why isn't God going to fix this? And he just kept saying, I don't know. I don't know. And he would call 2 in the morning just to check in on me. And I was so angry at him because I'm like, you believe in this? And why do you believe in this? And, and he just... He just loved me. Never met him. And finally, I did meet him. He actually did Christian and I's wedding. And the other person who was influential was when I started dating Christy. Up to that point, I, I started kind of faking Christianity to some degree, right? I would go, I'd do the thing, man, eh, whatever, you know. It's like, that's what I grew up with, right? So, oh, God, oh. And I remember I met Christy, and um, her first words to me was when I, you know, I don't know if I can date you. Um, let's maybe go on a platonic date. I didn't know what the word platonic meant. I'm like, sweet! Uh, they should get a dictionary every once in a while. Um, but I remember she said, Mark, I, I want to date a godly man. And I, I was like, nah, yeah, yeah, godly man. And I remember God just hit me in that moment. And I think so many times in my life, there's things that, that shatter, shatter my dreams. And there's, there's things that I've done that I deserve to learn a lesson from. I, I guarantee that, right? There's so many things that, that I, I make, make, make a mistake, and then all of a sudden, okay, I need to learn a lesson from that. And God's going to use that for me to, to learn a lesson. And, and so many times, I think, even in that, we, we misuse that, right? Because sometimes when our, our dreams shatter, our life starts caving in, it's not just a lesson we need to learn, right? And then we, we, get, we get scared, and so we, we start saying those quintessential Christian things, you know, it's God's will. Everything works out f with, with God. And those are truths. But when our dreams start falling through, those don't feel like that foundation. In, in my work, I, I've worked in several different places. Um, one time I, I was a, a counselor at an, an emergency room for crisis. And I remember being with people with their dreams shattering in front of them. Working with, with, with a family where their, their loved one is, is not doing well. Tragedy happened. They come to me. I was a chaplain. They come to me, Mark, you've got to pray. You've got to pray that they're going to get better. And I didn't know what to do. 
And sometimes it didn't. And that felt like that dream shattered right there in that. Or I work, I work in, a, in another setting where it's, I'm working with people going through trauma. You know, trauma from maybe a childhood, you know, abusive situation. And, and to, to say, oh, God's going to teach you a lesson out of this. I mean, that just seems mean, doesn't it? Or why would God even allow us to be in that situation? And then all of a sudden it seems like our, our dream of who God is to get us out of that shatters in front of us. And I think really when it comes down to it, as we celebrate this week, Jesus' triumphant entry, he came knowing full well that we wouldn't understand what our true dream in our heart would be it was an encounter with him. And sometimes in our life when those, those things happen and there's no explanation and it feels like God is silent in it, I always say God's not. It's, it's nothing that we can do to change it. Maybe God wants to change it. Maybe God will change it. But really, what happens is God wants an encounter with you. He wants to, he wants to, to know you and have him know that he loves you, even through the pain. I think so many times, even in that, what happens is I, I condition myself. I condition myself to not feel it, right? This idea of pain. I work in a, in a correctional institute right now, and I deal a lot with addiction. And a lot of times addiction, the way I address addiction is there is past pain that we're trying to hide from through something that's going to give us relief. And I find that even in my Christian life. So many times I want to get rid of the pain. So what I do is I skim over things. I skim over things where, okay, I remember working at the hospital, and, and after a while, honestly, after a while, I prayed so many times for people to get healed, and it just didn't, didn't happen. And so then, for me, it was painful because I'm like, God, you got to show up. you got to fix this. And so after a while, I kind of skimmed over the pain, and I would do these half-hearted prayers, right? I mean, not in a bad way. I wasn't mean or bitter, but I was scared because I didn't want to get hurt if God didn't show up in the way I expected him to. I have a friend right now. Um, I met with him this last week, and, oh, man, this guy's awesome. Uh, he is going through some tough times in life. Uh, he's got a, a very sick kid, um, and, you know, he, he's talking with me this week, and he's like, Mark, Hey man, I'm gonna I'm gonna try something weird. Uh, we're going to this like prayer revival for healing, and I've never done anything like that. And uh, my kid just got to get better. And my first thought, you know, my first thought was, don't get chopes up. Versus, I hope you get to encounter God. I hope you get to encounter God in a way that you're not even expecting. I hope God heals. I'm never going to, I don't want to shy away from that because of my pain, that God might not. I want to encounter God where he says, I, God, I want you to show up, and if, if you do this, this is going to be even awesome, but I want people to encounter God. It's like that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you remember that? I love that story. I can never spell their names. Um, remember the story they get put in the furnace? It's a little song, too. I'm not going to sing that um, until I get the guitar. Uh, but remember that? It was like they put in the furnace. But what, remember what Shadrach means? Shadrach means, you know them. Their response was this. They said, we're never going to bow down to you because our God's going to save us. But even if he doesn't, that right there always messed with me. I want to have the faith if I'm going to be put in a very hot kiln that God's going to save me, right? And they had that faith, but they had the reality of it. You know what? Even if God doesn't, we're only going to worship him. I'm like, dang. I would stop at the first part, right? <laughs> I've been the guy like, you know, hey, everybody's bowing down. Oh, my shoe's untied. Ooh, we love you, God. You know, it would be one of those things where I've been trying to get out because I don't want to feel that pain. But so many times in our life, instead of running from pain, God wants to be there in it. God doesn't, he's not a 
tyrannical God who's like, watch this, you're going to learn a lesson. Boom, you get to suffer. Boom, you get to suffer. Oh, you in the back, you're doing pretty good. I'm going to let that slide. Right? No, that's not God. God, if we see through this week as his triumphant entry, he weeps over Jerusalem. He says, I, if only you knew the true power of who I was. If only you can understand what I'm doing here today. And he didn't, he didn't reject us when we don't get that. He keeps pursuing us. He wants to connect with us. There, um, <clears throat> Larry Crabb writes this in his book. He says, when, when he, he's looking at this, he says, um, we no longer live for blessings. No longer do we pray, God, here's what I need, give it to me. Now we rest in agitated rest that includes the agony of frustration, but still we rest. We learn to say, God, whoever you are, whatever you do, that is all I want. I demand nothing. I will wait for you. To me, that is so hard. I think that's, that's my prayer. That's, that right there to me is, is when we, we worship. Where I'm not just singing a song, I'm not just reading my Bible, but I'm longing to know Jesus more. Where I'm not just waving my broken palm, palm branch when things are going right. And I, I bring out my praise for God even in the midst of troubles and hardships and things are going wrong. And I'm like, God, I don't get you. I don't, I, there's so many things I want from you, but ultimately I want to know you more and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship you. I'm going to allow this to happen. Not as just a learning moment, but a moment where I get to feel the pain and get connect with you. When it comes down to it, I want to be like Peter. Peter denied Jesus, but what happens when, when we'll talk about this at Easter, right? When the, the women go up there and say, hey, he's not there, what does Peter do? He bolts up there. He runs. He's the first one in the tomb. Everybody else kind of is keeping up with him. They stop at the door like, whoa, and he's like, bam, right in there. Right? He's not there. And then later on, remember the story when, when they're fishing? He goes back to his life, still, still kind of confused. What is this? Who is this guy? I've been following him for three years, but who is this guy? And remember, and they're fishing, and all of a sudden, this guy on the shore does, hey, guys, you're not doing very good. And like, guys, we're, we're professional fishermen. And he's like, throw your net on the other side. And he's like, oh, brother, we'll do it. And then bam, he pulls. And John, uh, it was John looks and says, isn't that the Lord? And Peter being Peter, doesn't wait for the boat to get shore, jumps. He knew, he knew that what he did was a disillusionment about who Jesus was. But he, he so longed to be with Jesus, to be part of him. He jumped out of the boat, swam to shore, and Jesus taught him at that moment. And from that point, I really feel that, that Peter, he didn't ever back down. Jesus told him how he was going to die at that moment. I'm like, oh, brother. Like, hey, you've been right on a lot of stuff. This is not very good. But Jesus is like, this is, and he, Peter's like, man, I love you. So, today is Palm Sunday. More than our palms. More than a broken branch. It's a day we celebrate the beginning of everything God has done for us. We celebrate his broken body. We celebrate his spilling of his blood. And some of us in here, and honestly, this is me most of the time, guys, I forget this. I forget that I, my ultimate thing is really longing to know God. I want God to fix things. And so many times I can lose heart. I think this week, as we remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us, this is a time where we allow God's presence to come in. And this is a verse I want to, I'm going to have the band come up. That's my sign right here. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, one of my favorite verses. 
because it's everything I, I feel like God, God wants us to know. He says this. He said, this is a truth, truth, trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If, if we disown him, he will also disown us. Those make sense, right? If I do, if I do, if I do. But then this last part right here shows the, the power of God's love. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If you guys can stand with me real quick. This is where we... Uh, Bow our eyes and close our heads. Just kidding. The other way around. Um, you guys just, in this moment, there's some of us in this room have been going through pain. We're seeing um, possibly dreams shatter in front of us. We... We don't know what it looks like to have Jesus enter triumphantly through these things. And I want to pray for you. Because I think so many times in this time, it, it, we can hear the talks, we can hear all this stuff, but really when it comes down to it, I need Jesus. I can't just do things. I need Jesus. I'm in pain. I need Jesus. And more than just fixing the problem, I need Jesus. Jesus. So, as we pray right now, God, I just pray for anybody in this room or watching uh, that God, right now, Lord, Lord, you don't allow us to be afraid. You don't, you don't allow us to hold on to this pain. Or God, if, even if we do hold on to this pain, Lord, I just ask that you break through, that we have an encounter with you. And God, I don't want to shy away from the fear of things not happening. So God, if, if, there's, if there's anybody who needs healing or freedom or anything, God, I pray right now that your spirit just come and free and heal in the name of Jesus. And God, not just because you want to just do the things that we want, because, but because God, you love us to the depths of who you are. You gave your son to die. Not just to die, that everybody dies, but to 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 connect us to you, to form a bridge to you. So God, I just pray for anybody in here right now, if they're, if they're even lacking that faith, lacking that, that I don't know what's going on, God, I just pray for an encounter first and foremost. God, you break down those barriers, you break down those lies, you break down even our own ideas, our disillusionment of who you are. God, I pray right now you break that down. And you allow your spirit and your love and who you are to fill that place. And God, sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes I, we feel you're not even listening, but God, we know, I know that you, you are. And God, I just pray that through this time, if people are struggling or, or hurting, God, that this is a time that there's an encounter with you. Let God, we can sing Hosanna. We can say this is who Jesus is. That we can worship you for who you are. So this is the time, guys. I want us just right now. So many times in my life, worship is one of those things where we just I just do my thing. This is a time. This is us. This is a long of your heart. This is a prayer. This is something that's saying, God, I need you in this moment. So let's worship. I don't want to be afraid every time I face the wind.